So nutritional will be the most common ones. And what are the pointers that if you have somebody who comes to you with the rickets for the first time has a possibility of a non-nutritional or a refractory rickets? So significant failure to thrive features of RTA like polyuria, atherotic breathing. If you have a pathological fracture, you have quite worried about in that scenario. Now, what are the common causes of non-nutritional rickets slash refractory rickets, Vibha? Uh, uh, so renal tubular acidosis, hypophosphatemic rickets, and the most common would be renal failure. So that is something, of course, you will do it in the initial phase. So we'll try to go forward on that. So rickets seems to be a reasonably simple condition to evaluate, but often we have got confusions which go off. So we had this three-year-old boy who was referred to us in which of quote unquote a diagnosis of refractory rickets had been given vitamin D, 60,000 60, international units, and complained of bone pain and a high alkaline phosphatase. And based upon these findings, the clinical team thought that this could be a possibility of a refractory rickets. But as we will discuss subsequently, that we do have some physiological responses to vitamin D, which include an increase in bone pain and an increase in alkaline phosphatase, which do not indicate a refractory rickets. And what we need to, really need to look at is the line of healing which was present in this case. So while this case was unnecessarily being advised, a lot of investigation in the form of a blood gas, calcitriol level and PTH, they were not required. So what we need to understand is that there are certain scenarios in which you will respond in a way and you don't need to work up extensively from that figure. So this is a normal response for rickets. On the contrary, we have this 14-year-old boy who presented to us with lower limb abnormalities predominantly and had been given huge amounts of vitamin D and there was no line of healing. He was again referred as quote-unquote nutritional rickets. So in the first case, we were making physiology into pathology. Here, a pathology was turned out to be in a physiological cause. And this unfortunately resulted in the development of nephrocalcinosis. If you have a late onset rickets with predominant lower limb abnormalities with a normal PTH, normal calcium, Think of hypophosphatemic rickets. So when we talk about rickets, we have to balance between the not doing too much workup where it is not required while not missing on pathological cases. So this missing and messing is something which we want to avoid. Rickets overall is a reasonably common condition, usually nutritional, but refractory rickets may pose challenge as we saw in the second case in that perspective. All of you can go and have a look at our website, learning.growsociety.in, which has got a lot of information about pediatric endocrinology, including resources and courses. Our e-learning portal on YouTube, which has got a lot of videos on pediatric endocrinology. Our validated courses, which provide information, including fellowship course and postgraduate courses as well. And our regular programs in the form of brand rounds, journal clubs, and PG lecture series as well. We've got publications across board from protocols to advanced in basic pediatric endocrinology and mobile applications which guide assessment. Look at the possible causes of rickets. It could be a phosphopenic form in which the phosphorus is the predominant problem or the calcioponic form in which the calcium is problem. But as I said, if your calcium is less, your PTH will go up and your phosphorus excretion will increase and you will be hypophosphatemic. So everybody who has got rickets is expected to be phosphopenic. So don't think that it's just that some forms of phosphopenic, but some, or you can say normocalcemic hypophosphatemic would be the more appropriate term. The condition which cause phosphopenic rickets could be a generalized tubular dysfunction like Fanconi syndrome or a more specific problem like hypophosphatemic rickets. They present to us with late onset lower limb abnormalities with normal PTH. And this is a characteristic finding in that regard. Vitamin D problems could be because of a low sunlight exposure, a problem in terms of low calcium intake. And often we tend to forget that calcium is very, very important. Now, while vitamin D deficiency is common, it has been shown in that many areas like Nigeria and India, it's actually the calcium deficiency, which is also an important contributing factor to deficiency and rickets. Remember that liver has got huge amount of 25 hydroxyl activity. 
So even advanced liver disease will only cause rickets. It is unusual to have rickets in liver disease if the patient is otherwise fine. So if you have a child who has got liver disease with rickets, think of two possibilities. One is malabsorption. Second is tyrosinemia or cystinosis in which you have got a liver damage, which has happened in that regards. Anti-epileptic intake like phenytoin and phenobarbitone will also cause inactivation of vitamin D, causing rickets. If you have problems in the 1-alpha hydroxylase effect like chronic kidney disease or VDDR, you will have that problem. Resistance of calcitriol action will again cause vitamin D dependent rickets. And these forms will present to you with early symptomatic presentation with bone pain and tetany and high parathyroid hormone levels. Now, finally, we need to understand that acidosis also has a direct adverse effects on bone health and you can have proximal RTA or distal RTA resulting in failure to thrive, polyuria, nephrocalcinosis and acerotic breathing. So, so uh, the most common cause could be the deficiency in calcium and the vitamin D and it has a very good therapeutic response. On the other end, we have a refractory rickets in which there is a, a lack of therapeutic response even after the adequate dose of calcium and vitamin D for 90 days. And among this refractory rickets, the other, uh, it could be calciopenic, which includes EDR1, 2, renal failure and malabsorption. They have a very early onset they have a high PTH due to secondary hyperparathyroidism and low calcium level. On the next category, it could be it could occur in the setting of acidosis and predominantly in the distal RTA. The child will present with polyuria, failure to thrive, and of course the nephrocalcinosis. And in the last category, we have the phosphopenic cause, which includes the X-link and the X-link dominant autosomal recessive of hypophosphatomic rickets. It could be associated with Fanconi syndrome, like in the cystinosis, cystinemia and the tyrosinemia, and the hypercalcemic variant. They have, in comparison to the calcipenic rickets, they have a later onset, and it generally involves the layer limb deformity, and in comparison to low calcium, they have normal calcium and the normal PTH level. Mm -hmm. So coming to the common cause of uh, rickets is this the calcium deficiency. It mainly occurs when there is a decreased intake of the calcium. So this increase due to the increased intake, there will be low serum calcium. And mm -hmm. this low serum calcium will increase the PTH level, causing the secondary hyperparathyroidism which will finally result in increased excretion of phosphate from the urine, causing the low phosphate levels. And the other cause could be the increased inactivation of the 25 hydroxyl vitamin D, and which occurs when there is increased activity of 24 hydroxylase, and which decreases the calcitriol level. So, the calcium, calcium deficiency is always secondary to the vitamin D deficiency and they improve when there is the adequate calcium supplementation. And the other thing here is that if you have low calcium, that's what you're trying to suggest, is that if your calcium is low, DPS is high, the whole process is hyperactive. So you're losing out and useless products of vitamin D are also being formed. Yes, sir. So your, whatever vitamin D you are there, you become deficient as well. Yes. Now coming to the vitamin D deficiency, Vitamin D deficiency could be due to the reduced sunlight exposure and this causes a decreased production of the calcitriol as the sunlight is the main uh, this substrate for the calcitriol production and this low calcitriol will increase the PTH level and if we see in the early stages of vitamin D deficiency, the calcium level is low but the phosphate level is normal. Do, uh, in response to this low calcium, what it tries to compensate with this hypocalcemia, it increases the PTH level, which tries to normalize the calcium, but it also increases the phosphate excretion from urine. So later on, we have the calcium level becomes normal, but the phosphate level decreases. And in the later stages, in the late stages, the body fails to compensate for this uh, hypocalcemia and the both the calcium and the phosphate levels are low in the late stages so when there is a in long standing uh, vitamin d deficiency we have a secondary hyperparathyroidism which causes the 
which produces the clinical feature of Fankini syndrome. And in Fankini syndrome, there is a generalized tubular dysfunction, which causes a loss of phosphate from the urine. So if we conclude the causes of vitamin D deficiency, it is mainly due to the reduced sun exposure, malabsorption, and obesity, which causes the sequestration of vitamin D in the adipose tissue. And this Fankini syndrome is very important to identify because you may have mild metabolism. Okay, so. so don't confuse somebody who has a long-standing vitamin D deficiency with mild acidosis with RT. Yeah. This we have seen often getting confused in that regard. So as Sarah said, the important cause of the uh, rickets could be the chronic kidney disease. And what happens in the chronic kidney disease is there is a decreased synthesis of 1-alpha hydroxylate and there are many factors which have a very detrimental effect on the bone health. One is a decreased synthesis of the hydroxylase, the high phosphate levels which triggers the, uh, which causes the high FGF23 level and which decreases the 1-alpha hydroxylase and there will be the low calcitriol. And this low calcitriol will have will cause the secondary hyperparathyroidism and this secondary hyperparathyroidism will finally cause the low phosphate level. But in this chronic kidney disease, we have acidosis along with the high phosphorus. Generally, if the patient present with the rickets, we generally have low, cal low phosphorus level. But if there is a rickets and the phosphorus level is high, we should always think of there could be the cause of the chronic kidney disease. And they will present with growth failure and the, they have a normal ALP level because the bone turnover is normal in the chronic kidney disease. So this is the very interesting paper as published by Dr. Anurag Bajpayee showing the various causes of refractory rickets and it clearly shows that the uh, vitamin D dependent rickets have a very early onset and uh, along with the distal RTA, while the proximal RTA and the hypophosphatic rickets will present later. And the distal RTA has a very, uh, presents a very, uh, have very severe features like polyuria, fractures, um, and uh, even enamel hypoplasia in contrast to the proximal RTA. And in the vitamin D dependent rickets, uh, the patient will have severe hypocalcemia that could result in the seizures as well. So now coming to the vitamin D dependent rickets, what happens here is we have, a, um, there is a problem in the 1-hydroxylase synthesis. So it, uh, it results in the VDDR1. And when there is a resistance to the action of vitamin D, um, this, uh, this leads to the vitamin uh, VDDR2. And this uh, Vitamin, this VDDR1 and VDDR2 have hypocalcemia and the low phosphate levels, and they have high PTH level as a cause of uh, resulting in the secondary hyperparathyroidism. This condition is very difficult to treat and it requires a lot of, lot of uh, uh, calcium as in the IV form. And the children who have VDDR2 present with the alopecia because vitamin D is very important for the folli hair follicle growth. So these patients with vitamin D dependent rickets have a very early onset, they have severe hypocalcemia and they're very difficult to manage and requires a huge amount of IV calcium supplementation. So coming to the impure vitamin D effect, what it means the vitamin D is not working properly or not being synthesized in the adequate amount. So it could be due to defect in the activation where there is a deficiency in 25 hydroxylase as present in the VDDR1B and the advanced liver disease. It could be problem in the 1-alpha hydroxylase, which results in VDDR1A. And it could be due to the increased inactivation of 25 OHD to the, by the increased activation of 25 hydroxylase enzyme. And it is generally present in the uh, when there is an in, intake of drugs like uh, ND epileptic drugs, which includes phenytoin, carbamazepine, etc. And now coming to the VDDR2, which where there is a defect in the uh, action of it, uh, this uh, vitamin D, there is a resistance to the action of vitamin D, and we have this VDDR2A where there is a uh, DNA binding defect, and VDDR2B where there is a ligand binding defect. So these patients present very early, they have severe hypocalcemia and difficult to manage too. So if I summarize the inherited cause of the vitamin D effect, 
We have 25 hydroxylase deficiency, which is due to mutation is CYP2A1 gene. They have very low level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, low level calcitrio. They present early and they present with refractory rickets. In the one alpha, uh, one hydroxylase deficiency, it is due to mutation is 27B1 mutation, and they have high 25 OHD level, while the calcitriol level is very low, and they present with severe hypercalcemia, resulting in seizures too. And in the next category of VDDR2, uh, VDDR2A is due to the defect in the DNA binding, and it has both uh, uh, high levels of 25 hydroxy is vitamin D as well as the calcitriol level. And these patients have severe hypercalcemia along with the alopecia. In the VDDR2B, there is a defect in the ligand binding and it results in high 25 OHD and the calcitriol mm -hmm. level. And they also present with hypocalcemia. Now, coming to the very important cause of the refractory rickets, that is the hypophosphatemic rickets. Generally, all the rickets have low uh, phosphate level except for the chronic kidney disease. In the, uh, the main abnormality involved uh, here in the hypophosphatemic rickets is increased synthesis of FGF23 or decreased inactivation of 20, uh, FGF23 due to as this uh, FGF23 is a phosphate union and it increases the phosphate excretion from the urine resulting in low serum phosphate levels. And this uh, uh, low, this FGF23 also inhibits the activity of 1-alpha hydroxylate resulting in the low calcitriol. And when their calcitriol level is low, it decreases the calcium absorption from the intestine. So this hypophosphatemic rickets could present as isolated form when there is a fixed uh, fixed fixed gene de defect when there is a mesenchymal tumors and it can be associated with Pankini syndrome uh, which includes uh, cystinosis tyrosinosis in case of Wilson disease also and when there is a heavy metal poisoning. So if I categorize the hypophosphatemic rickets it could be congenital which involves which is FGF23 dependent, where there is a where the levels of FGF23 is high. It includes the FASX gene defect, which is X-link dominant, TMP1 defect, which is autosomal recessive, ENPP1, which is also autosomal recessive, and the uh, GNAS mutation, which is present in the McCune Albright syndrome. And where, uh, the another category includes the FGF23 independent, where the FGF23 level is normal. It is also uh, known as the hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria because the um, calcium um, because this uh, uh, calcitriol level uh, action is preserved in this condition and it is due to it is present in NPT2A and C gene defect and also the DEN syndrome. So it's in, very important to identify this variant because the urinary calcium is high. I have. And if you give them calcium, it will further, it will further increase. Further worsening the epidemic. In the acquired causes, the mesenchymal tumor, melanocytic nervous syndrome, and the epidermal nevi. And these causes hyperphosphatic rickets because they produce F, uh, this FGR23 from the tumor cells. Now coming to the very important cause of the uh, uh, this refractory rickets, and it includes the renal tubular acidosis. So in the proximal RTA, there is an abnormality in the bicarbonate filtration, and uh, the kidney will filter the bicarbonate until the level of bicarbonate becomes very low. When the uh, level is very low in the blood, the filtration of bicarbonate stops, and this leads to the acidic urine. This condition is self-limiting, and uh, also, the, there is a presence of acidic urine and there will be no nephrocalcinosis. On the other hand, when there is a distal RTA, there is a defect in the acidification of the urine. This condition is very severe, present with fractures, and the differentiating feature is that they have alkaline urine and presence of nephrocalcinosis. While the other hand, type 4 RTA, which is the hypercalamic uh, RTA, uh, it doesn't cause any rickets. So, uh, I'll say uh, we have to uh, look for the phosphate level first because uh, it will clearly rule out whether it includes a chronic kidney disease or it is the other form of uh, rickets. And then we have to go further as the sir will discuss later. Linda is asking what about a patient with rickets that has been on medication for three months yet to come for checkup, default for two months yet to come for review. 
how do you manage such a patient? So if somebody has a big issue in terms of compliance, that is the only other indication other than malabsorption where we consider giving an injectable vitamin D single dose or a stross therapy which will work in that regard. Dr. Shubha is mentioning child with rickets come to us has taken treatment for many doctors. Should we do vitamin D level first? What level of vitamin D diagnosed vitamin deficiency rickets? So if there's a long history of treatment, there is not line of healing. Maybe getting a vitamin D will be of help. But usually you're already dealing with refractory rickets in that scenario.